to the first Buffy scheduling system video. In this video, what you accept, you get. We're going to talk about how we are taught to design and run our shops, the conventional wisdom. We will discuss how, by following conventional wisdom, we actually create one of the challenges and allow the other eight to thrive. And my conventional wisdom makes 99 plus percent due date performance very difficult and makes reducing lead times just about impossible. So let's get started. These were the nine biggest challenges you reported facing when trying to schedule your shop. If you look closely at all of these, you will notice that they are all sources of variability. And as we discussed in that special report, all of these sources of variability make it difficult to schedule. In fact, we said that your schedule is likely to be dead on arrival. And all of this variation makes it tough to meet customer due dates, and consistently reducing lead times isn't any easier. But this is only part of the picture. Even if none of these sources of variability existed, life only gets slightly easier. Scheduling does not become a piece of cake. This means that there is something even more fundamental going on. And that something, conventional wisdom, how we are taught to design and schedule our processes. So let's look into what conventional wisdom is. Let's work with an example to explain conventional wisdom. Let's take a shop that has five departments. I have labeled the five departments as saw, turn, mill, grind, and pack and ship. And generally the flow is from left to right. But for many shops, our flow can also reverse directions at times. So you might have a job that goes saw, turn, mill, back to turn, grind, pack and ship, where we actually go backwards for a second turn off. But generally, flow is from left to right. And you may have the situation where you have more than five departments. And you probably also experience jobs that don't go through all the departments. But from a 50,000 foot view, we can get an idea of what we're dealing with. And of course, many of you have outside vendors for heat treatment, plating, bronzing, etc. But for now, we're just going to focus on our internal processes. Conventional wisdom says, to maximize profitability, you must maximize the use of your resources, both people and equipment. And to maximize the use of your resources, you must balance capacity. Balance capacity is the most efficient way to run. There is no waste in a balanced system. It is beautiful. So this is conventional wisdom. So we design our processes to be balanced. Balance means that the capacity of each step is relatively equal to the other steps. They have the same average capacity. We strive for balanced capacity because it means that there will be no waste. The purpose is to be able to fully utilize all of our operating expenses, all people and equipment. So if we want to maximize our profits, we must make the best use of our resources. We must optimize the utilization of all resources in our shop. If a resource is idle, then we are losing money. Or at the very least, we have invested more money than necessary, which means we are wasting money. And this conventional wisdom around utilizing all resources to their maximum comes from our cost accounting roots. And I'll go a little more into cost accounting later. So back to our example. If we plan on selling 20 per day, then we need capacity at the saw for 20 per day and at turning for 20 per day and at the mill and so on. This is the balanced capacity portion. So if on average each step in our process could produce 20 per day, then how many should we, able, should we be able to produce every day? Well, if I could hear your answers, you're probably saying something like, well, 20, of course. But actually, 20 is very unlikely, and here's why. What does an average of 20 mean? It means that sometimes we can do more and sometimes we can do less, but on average, we produce 20. And that's true for each department. So if 20 is the average for each step, then we can calculate the probability of ever producing 20. Since 20 is the average, there is a 50% chance of getting a 20 at any one step. So statistically, we take the 50% or 0.5 
2 to 5th because we have 5 departments, which means that the probability of getting 20 out in any one day is 3.13%. This loss of output as we process is due to the variability. If you looked at any one step in isolation, you would see an average of 20 with the variability of plus or minus 3. But we have five steps in combination, or interdependency between five steps, which means we have five dependent events. So the variability is additive, which means the more steps in a process, the more variability and the harder to increase output. Another way to say this is that whatever comes out of step A gets passed to step B. The variability of B occurs around what was passed. So let's say that 18 gets passed from A to B. This is now plus or minus 3. However, it cannot be plus 3, but it can be minus 3, and so on. But the question still remains, if we're not likely to get 20 out, what will come out of this system? The system, by the way, that we perfectly designed to get 20. I did not know the answer to that question, so I used Excel to do something called a Monte Carlo simulation, and I ran this simulation a thousand times. It produced a distribution where the average was just less than 10. Yes, 10. That's pretty shocking. I also got 20 or more from the simulation about 3% of the time. Now let's talk about where the constraint is in this system. So where is the constraint in this shot? Well, since we are continually striving to balance capacity, the constraint moves. It moves depending on how the mixed gods and the variability gods treat us in any particular week. And let's just take an example. Imagine things were relatively calm and a really big job comes in. When we start working on this really big job, the constraint initially will be at the saw. Then the job will progress from the saw to churning. And when that happens, our constraint moves along with it. So when we have balanced capacity, our, our constraint moves according to the mix. So it is like the pig going through the python. And interestingly, that challenge number three that we had in that special report our mix can vary wildly and so our constraint moves, is created. Actually, we chose this situation, the situation of the constraint moving, when we chose to have balanced capacity. And trying to keep everyone busy and all the machines busy, that's part of that balanced capacity. So when you have balanced capacity and therefore a moving constraint, it's like getting stuck playing that arcade game whack-a-mole, you know, where you take the club and you chase the mole around, where you deal with the same stuff over and over again. It's really hard to leverage a moving constraint. Now let's talk a little bit about cost accounting. Cost accounting demands high local efficiencies, which pushes us towards balancing capacity. Exactly balancing capacity is difficult to do. It's hard to achieve high efficiencies on all resources simultaneously. But it does get easier if we have more choices or more work that is available to work on. The way to have more choices is by, by making all the available work available to the shop as soon as possible. So essentially we increase our work and process or our WIP increasing the options of what can be run so we can more easily keep high efficiencies. So that's why I say that balanced capacity is evil. It causes us to increase work and process. And the more work and process we have, the longer jobs spend waiting to be run. And if you're familiar at all with Q theory, you know that Q theory proves that the more items in Q, the more time they spend waiting. Two facts make a plant with balanced capacity an illusion and a danger for any company. 
They are, number one, statistical fluctuations, and number two, dependent events, which means a balanced, a balanced plant has very high variability on what is possible to produce. Now add to that these nine challenges, which are all just some form of additional variability on top of what we already have running a balanced facility, and, and the fact that orders spend a lot of time on the floor, hmm, it's pretty tough. We are fighting an uphill battle. So let's talk a little bit now about velocity. And you've heard me mention the velocity scheduling system. Well, velocity is the amount of time an order spends on the floor. It's the elapsed time from releasing the order to the floor until the order is complete. When work and process is high and variability is high, then velocity is going to be low. Or, another way to say it, orders spend a lot more time on the floor. With this amount of variability and the amount of time a job will spend waiting for its turn to run, your schedule will be dead on arrival. It will be very difficult, if not impossible, to meet customer due dates. And you have little hope of reducing lead time using the conventional wisdom of balancing capacity. So what have we learned so far? And what should you be doing? Well, first we learned that balancing capacity is evil. So you should be unbalancing your capacity. Now next time we'll talk more about how to do this and about creating a control point. We also learned that high work and process creates variability and more wait time. You should work on reducing your work and process. And if you reduce your work and process, this will reduce your variability, your wait time, and your lead times. And of course, your velocity will increase. Now, don't forget to leave your comments on this video on the download page. So that's all for now. Watch your inbox for my next email and more videos are on the way. Wishing you success. This is Dr. Lisa Lang. Thank you.